The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly was directed by Sergio Leone and is a masterpiece. There's no question. How many films out there can be parodied? And even if you've never seen it, you instantly know the parody. If you see any film or any comedy sketch that has this sound, you know it's The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, even if you've never seen it. That's how famous this film is, and deservedly so. Virtually every single sequence in this film is iconic. The characters, the stare-downs, the duels, the cinematography, the music, Ennio Morricone's incredible themes, everything about this movie is unescapable in American pop culture. You cannot make a Western film anymore without being compared to this film. It is impossible. After this film came out, this was like the Jaws of Westerns. You can't make a shark movie without being compared to Jaws. And when you hear people talking about this movie, you get so hyped about it, you get excited about it, and then you watch it, and it's actually that good. This is one of those films that just does not disappoint. Let's talk about the greatest Western ever made, my favorite personal one, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And it opens with a sequence that immediately subverts expectations. You see these men approaching each other from opposite sides, and you think to yourself, they're about to have a gun duel. But no, they burst into a place and try to rob it, and out pops The Ugly, played by Eli Wallach in one of his best roles and the one that he's probably the most known for. And next, we're introduced to Angel Eyes, played by Lee Van Cleef, also known as The Bad, in a brilliant image that has everything in focus, including this man's shoulder in the foreground and Angel Eyes in the doorway. Leone did a lot of beautiful things with the camera here, and he used a lot of camera tricks to try to make us feel like we were watching something that was almost painted. This film looks like it was created on a canvas. And if you ever get the chance to see it in the theaters, please do, because these images just explode on a gigantic screen. And next we meet The Good, Clint Eastwood's cigar-chewing, eye-squinting blondie, also known as Joe in A Fistful of Dollars, and Monco in A Few Dollars More. He does go by names in these films. It's just that they're never the same. Also, there is serious doubt on whether or not these films are actually connected. Sergio Leone has said that he never really meant to make a continuing story arc, and this can be supported by the fact that he reuses actors who perished in one film and show up with different names in the next film, but there are also people who think that this film is a prequel to the first two, because this takes place in the middle of the American Civil War, whereas the other films didn't have anything to do with that, and Blondie adopts his famous outfit at the end of this film, whereas in the other two, he had it from the very beginning. And people use weapons that were around in different time periods, and so people are always trying to figure out what the timeline, what is the chronology, and I think it's kind of a superfluous thing. You don't really have to worry about it. It's clear that basically Leone was making spiritual successors. He was basically experimenting with this character, played by Eastwood, putting him in different scenarios, changing some things around, not really concerning himself with a continuing storyline. The way I view the Dollars trilogy is sort of the way I view Edgar Wright's Cornetto trilogy. They're unofficial follow-ups, but they have similar actors playing similar roles. They're kind of connected, but they're not actually connected. One of the best things I ever heard about this film in particular was said by Roger Ebert in his Great Movies review of it. He talked about the fact that Sergio Leone doesn't concern himself that much with plot or storyline. He's a director of situations. He puts you in the middle of a stare down, a duel, an action sequence in a saloon, a war that suddenly breaks out with the two main characters in the middle of it, or a hot desert sun sequence, two opposing scenes where each man tortures the other person by not letting them have water and stranding them in the middle of nowhere. It's almost like he's creating a serialized adventure television show where every 30 minutes there's some new thing to worry about or some new scheme or sequence that's going to get your blood pumping. And they all interweave beautifully, particularly in this one. The first two films are good westerns, but with each passing one, Leone improved on all of his techniques And with this film, he proved himself to be a master of the craft. And I wish he had directed more films because his following ones after this, Once Upon a Time in the West and America, are both also extremely good. And there just, there wasn't enough of him. It was kind of like Kubrick, in my opinion, to be honest. I think Kubrick is the better filmmaker in the long run. 
but they both were the type of guys that directed a movie every once in a while, only when they really felt like it. And I guess that's what you get when you get the true masters. They just they get their hands on a story they like and they're ready to go. But unless they fall deeply in love with the material, they're only going to make a few movies. And what Leone left us is good enough for me, but I wish we had a little more. If I were to do a review of this film without talking a little bit about Ennio Morricone's music, that would have been a failure. Yeah, everyone said everything that you could possibly think to say about his themes. And there's a reason for that. You can't have this movie without that music. It's been imitated, it's been parodied, so many other soundtracks have been inspired by it. As I said earlier, it's inescapable. You really cannot make a Western without music like that involved. When you see a desert landscape and some old rundown town, you automatically hear somebody whistling and some epic trumpet solo in the background. You can't get rid of it. It's in our consciousness. Most of Quentin Tarantino's work, especially Django Unchained, has been in some way inspired by Sergio Leone. I mean, you can look at even Cowboy Bebop and see how this film inspired it. There's an entire episode called Cowboy Funk that has a theme by Yoko Kano that sounds like this. Even the opening titles of Cowboy Bebop are very reminiscent of what Leone did in A Fistful of Dollars and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. But let's not forget about a filmmaker that's very important to mention, and that's Akira Kurosawa, who made Yojimbo, which very much so inspired Leone when he made A Fistful of Dollars. I mean, some have even gone as far as to call it a shot-for-shot -shot remake. And Yojimbo, I would say, is a better film. So if you haven't had a chance to see Yojimbo, please do see that, and all of his other films, Seven Samurai, they're great masterpieces, just like you've heard. They're all really good. Leone is a director who understands visual storytelling very well. He is so good at creating images on the screen where you don't even need dialogue to understand exactly what he's trying to convey to you. The first like 10, 11 minutes of this movie doesn't even have a single word in it. And especially with the finale, which we'll talk about soon. But there's a great sequence where Tuco is trying to find Blondie. And he's doing so by tracking various campfires and finding cigars. And he finally finds one, and he's able to puff a little smoke out of it. And he's like, okay, I know I'm close. And you know this because of all the other dried out cigars he picked up beforehand, and he finally finds one that still has some fire in it. And you can see it on his eyes. He knows Blondie is near. The way Leone positions all of his characters in a confrontation is so great. You have Angel Eyes, who's looking for someone named Bill Carson. Then you have Tuco and Blondie coming across the dying body of Bill Carson. However, Bill Carson, who knows where this gold is at a graveyard, tells both Tuco and Blondie two different things. And one of them knows the cemetery, the other knows the gravestone. And so all of these guys end up coming together at the same place. This camp that Tuco and Blondie are not supposed to be in, and somebody's shouting for Bill Carson, and since he's dead, Tuco's like, yeah, I'm Bill Carson. We cut to Angel Eyes going, hmm, I've been looking for you. And what follows is one of the most realistic beatings of 1960s film. A lot of films from this era had some rather cheesy looking fight scenes. This sequence is brutal. It really looks like Tuco is basically being killed. It doesn't look fake. You can tell that he wasn't just making a film with fun, entertaining action sequences that he liked to look at. He really cared about composing complicated shots. There's a shot of Eastwood rolling down a sand hill, coming to a stop right in front of the camera. Then Wallach takes a bottle, rolls it down that hill, and it hits him in the side of his head. All of this had to be planned. That was a stunt that Eastwood did. The sand had to look like no one had ever walked on it before. And all of that had to happen perfectly. These are complicated shots that a lot of directors think about and they get cold sweats because they don't want to have to try to do all of that in one image. But Leone did it. And the film's all the better for moments like that. Once these three characters arrive at this cemetery where they all know this gold is buried somewhere, they all have different bits of information that could lead to the finding of it. It's, I don't know, top five finales of all time. The five to six minutes of them standing in this circle. There's no dialogue. It's just close-ups of their faces. They're sweating. They're squinting. Their hands are nearing their weapons. And Ennio Morricone gets a lot of praise here. This music is like next level. 
It's just so good. You can't rip it away from this movie. It is just ingrained within it. You can't have... It's like, you know, anything John Williams ever did in the 70s and 80s. You can't imagine those films without that music. And it's the same with Ennio Morricone and these spaghetti westerns. And my favorite moment in the entire stare down is Angel Eye's hand coming closer to the gun. Eastwood looks at him and the hand just goes away. Just that one look from that squinty eyed cigar chewing badass just made that hand. Nope, not going to take the gun yet. It's just this shit, man. This is what film is about. This is this is why I love movies. It's movies like this. Now, I must be honest. While I do love this film and I do think it's a masterpiece, there is an element of it that is truly awful. And that's the ADR, the dubbing process that has gone into some of the actors who were on set who were speaking their own native Italian language and were later dubbed into English. All three of the Dollars films suffer from this, especially the first one. The second one, not as bad, and also this one, not as bad. But that first one especially, you could tell that they just, they weren't ready for dubbing yet. And, and it's just like they, they kind of just shot scenes and said, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll make an amazing image and not worry that much about the sound, which was a major mistake. The audio in these films, very bad. Music, amazing. Audio, ugh. The dubbing really ruins some scenes, but you kind of just have to look past it. And I, I give older films a pass with this sometimes because I understand that the technology just wasn't quite there yet. But watching it today, it's a little rough. And I'm not going to downgrade the film because of that. All that being said, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is everything you've ever heard. It is the classic Western. It is a timeless, iconic masterpiece. And it absolutely deserves an A+. Guys, thank you so much, as always, for watching my continuing series of pre-1970s reviews. I just feel that it's important that people on YouTube, on this platform, talk about older films because they're the films that inspire the type of movies we're seeing today. I mean, all of our favorite films from the 80s and 90s and 2000s were inspired by this generation. The filmmakers who made films then, like Tarantino, for instance, are the people who saw Sergio Leone's films and said, yeah, I, I really want to do that myself. And I hope to see more older film reviews on YouTube, like 2001 A Space Odyssey, which I'm going to review in April, because that's that movie's 50th anniversary, April. March, we'll, we'll figure out March still. But I just wanted to let you know that April is definitely 2001 A Space Odyssey. Guys, thank you very much, as always, for watching. And if you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized.